morning, everybody, and welcome. We're delighted to have you here at Ukraine House. We extend a warm welcome to esteemed author, historian, Timothy Snyder. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. We're looking forward to this conversation. Without further ado, I will turn over the mic to our moderator, Ambassador John Herbst, director of the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council. John. Alexa, thank you. And it's an honor to be on the stage with um, Dr. Snyder. Uh, I don't believe in long introductions, so I'm just going to tell you that um, Tim Snyder is a professor of history at Yale University and an author of numerous books which will come up in the course of our conversation. Um, history Done Right is a guide to where we are today. And I can tell you that some, at times it appears that historians appear at exactly the right moment. And that is certainly true of Tim Snyder. Uh, we are now in a crisis in Europe, uh, maybe beyond Europe, uh, in the Western world. And if you look at, at Dr. Snyder's oeuvre, you'll see that what he's been writing about since his emergence as a professional historian speak precisely to this crisis. So he wrote a book um, the Reconstruction of Nations, Poland, Ukraine, Lithuania, and Belarus, which talks about their emergence from the 16th century till the 20th century. He wrote a book called Stalin in Europe, which talks about Soviet policy while Stalin was the first secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. He wrote a very well acclaimed book, all of his books have been well acclaimed, but one that received particular attention called Bloodlands, about the awful fate of the countries of Central and Eastern Europe as they stood between the two totalitarian powers of the Soviet Union and Hitler's Germany. And all of these books provide an historical entry to understand the crisis that we're facing today. So with that as an introduction, uh, I'd like to ask Tim to comment on the emergence of Ukraine as a nation its difficult path being submerged by large neighbors. Please. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you, John, for the very kind introduction. And thanks to Alexa and everyone who is here. Sorry, thank you. It was a really great and funny joke that I told right then. <laughs> did, did everybody miss it? It was hilarious. Um, <laughs> So now I want to thank John for the kind introduction and, uh, and thank Alexa and everyone who has made this public forum possible. I think public fora are really important, especially when dealing with a place that is fa as fantastically interesting as, as, as Ukraine. So when I think about Ukrainian history and the Ukrainian nation, I don't think about Ukraine as an exception. I think about Ukraine as the rule. I think that if you're trying to understand the shape of European history, or trying to understand the shape of world history for that matter, Ukraine is a very good place to start. The reason why it looks like an exception is that the same things that happen in other places just seem to happen with a greater intensity in Ukraine. So if the question is specifically about the origins of the nation, the history of the origin of the nation in Ukraine is very similar to other places. You have the, a very similar pattern of a 19th century national movement, which begins to talk about the past, led by poets and writers, then by historians who try to construct a narrative which shows how the nation goes back to the Middle Ages or earlier if possible. Then you have political activists who try to refine a language, then try to move into politics. This is all very, very standard issue stuff. What I just said would apply to Poland or the Czechs or the French or the Germans for that matter. The difference in Ukraine would be that Ukraine was divided in the 19th century between a couple of land empires, the Russian Empire and the Habsburg monarchy. And then the powerful difference in the 20th century is that Ukraine, as John's already suggested, was right in the center of two very powerful and very destructive projects, 
the, the, the Nazi desire to colonize Eastern Europe and the Soviet desire to colonize Ukraine in different ways, but at roughly the same time in the 1930s and 1940s. So the history of Ukraine as we look at it now is thoroughly dominated by the effects of the 1930s and 1940s. But even that is in a way typical. The problem of colonization and exploitation, as people from around the world will know, is a main theme of the history of the world. What's special about Ukraine is that a rather typical national movement encountered these forces in the middle of the 20th century, which were trying to do something extraordinary. Extraordinary in the bad sense of the word. I hope that was clear. Okay. Tim, we were ta talking earlier today about how interpretations of history shape perceptions and shape policies. Uh, you and I would both agree that the Western response to the Kremlin war in Ukraine over the past almost five years has been weak. And one reason for that is there's a Russian imperial interpretation of history which essentially says that Ukraine is theirs. I wonder if you could comment on that. So I, I, I think in, in Davos, it's really nice to talk about history because in Davos, like everything, what I notice about Davos is that everything that happens right now is incredibly important, but everything that happened last year at Davos is already out of date. So like last year we got incredibly excited about A, B, and C, and now we're excited about D, E, and F, and next year we're gonna be excited about G, H, and I. And there's a, there's a way in which the, the intense focus on the present and the speculative future blinds us to things that really matter and one of those is how we think about the past. I mean, history is a kind of invisible legislator in international affairs, because the things that we think we understand about history, we usually learned when we were young and vulnerable, and then when later on in adult life, they shape the way that we see politics without our even realizing it, as, as, as John says. And this is true of everybody. It's true of Americans, it's true of Canadians, it's certainly true of the British. If you look at the debate about Brexit now, it is thoroughly shaped. I mean, I would say more than anything else, the debate on Brexit is shaped by a, a British imperial version of history. So if the EU wanted to keep Great Britain, all they would have to do is say, yes, we would like to concede that in 1938, you intervened in the continent and stopped Hitler, and in 1956 at Suez, you stood down the Americans and preserved your empire, and India still belongs to you, right? <laughs> if, if the European Union could concede those things, then, then the Brexiteers would be happy. And I'm, I'm joking, but I'm not, right? This is true of all of us. We all have these ideas of history, which whether or not they're true or not, that's another question, can be, can be disabling. So in the specific case of the history of the nation, the interesting thing is the nation always refers to the past. There is no nation that doesn't refer to the past. We all do it. But the construction of the nation is a project for the future. Right, the, w every nation, whether it's the American nation, the Ukrainian nation, is a project for the future. You're raising your children in a society for the future. You're not raising them for the past. That would make no sense, right? So what, what can go wrong is when we lose, the, we, we lose the balance between the past and the future, and we start making decisions about the future on the basis of things that are so powerfully not true that they disable us or they prevent us from seeing the legitimacy of other people's aspirations. So the case of Ukraine is, 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 is an intense example of this, where, as I said before, Ukraine is a pretty typical, I mean, with all due respect, and I love you all, you know, especially like you Chopitskys in the front row, you're great. I love you all, but, but Ukraine is very normal. I, I mean, it could have been anybody in the front row, all right? I just want you to know that it's indiscriminate, right? Um, you guys are great too. Um, I can just tell who's not Ukrainian. Um, but, yeah, but 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 Ukraine is a U Ukraine is a pretty typical place, um, which faces unusually intense demands. So, in the in the case of Ukraine now, Ukraine is following a totally normal historical pattern in Europe, which is when empires break up, national movements realize that the state is necessary but not sufficient. So. That's the whole story of European integration. 
empires break up and the parts that remain realize that the state in Europe is necessary but not sufficient to prosperity, a liberal order, and so on. And so they join some larger structure. You, that happens in Western Europe after the Second World War. It happens in much of Eastern Europe after 1989. It was happening in Ukraine in around 2013. That's totally normal, right? That's what nations do in Europe. What's abnormal or what's intense is that the, for the first time, a country that was trying to move closer to Europe was invaded for, for, for doing so. But, and and I'm I'm, this is long-winded, but I'm answering your question. Many of our Russian friends or many of our Russian colleagues, just like the rest of us, are shaped by a sense of what history actually means. So Mr. Putin, um, you know, of whom I have many critical things to say, as you will know, but I think Mr. Putin sincerely believes in a story of history in which Ukraine is in some sense integrally connected to Russia. And he can't help believing it because he was taught that when he was young and helpless, right? But we have to be very careful that the things that we're taught when we're young don't end up delegitimizing the aspirations of people to have normal countries. Okay, thank you. Uh, it happens not often that an academic historian becomes a public intellectual, addressing issues that are related to their craft but go beyond. And um, that is a title that I think that Dr. Snyder bears. Because the work he's done, again, speaks directly to the crisis we've witnessed over the past several years. And so, for example, uh, there was an important cultural conference held in Kiev um, in the spring of 2014 to address the crisis created by the Kremlin aggression. And, and Tim was one of the outstanding speakers there. And he began to write uh, publicly about what was happening in Ukraine in the context precisely that you're giving us the historical context to right now. Uh, you wrote a book, uh, The Road to Unfreedom, which is really not history per se, but based upon deep historical understanding. And one of the things I liked about that book is you understand that ideas have consequences. And you looked at a Russian emigre philosopher, Ivan Ilin, who is Putin's favorite philosopher, and his authoritarian and geopolitical ideas, and how that helped form the policy which is creating a problem, certainly a great problem for Ukraine, but a problem for all of democratic Europe. With that, I turn it over to you. Yeah, no, thank you. So the, the conference in Ukraine and Kiev that you kindly mentioned um, was called Thinking Together. And I, I organized that um, with the help of some friends because I wanted people from the West to come to Kiev during Maidan or right in the aftermath of Maidan. Because what I noticed about Maidan and Ukraine in general is that what mattered to people's views about Ukraine was not whether they were right or left. What matters was, was whether they had actually come to the country or not. That was the thing that mattered. And so I was trying to bring people who mattered and who were interesting to Ukraine. But the other side of thinking together was that precisely because Ukrainian politics is like our politics but more so, I thought that people from the West would have things to learn. Um, I wrote an article at that time which, ba which, which, was, which basically said the battle for Ukraine is the battle for the West, which I deeply believe and still believe because the forms of political combat which were emerging then in Ukraine, especially digital warfare, information warfare, were the kinds of things which were then applied later in the European Union and in the United States, and I would say in the United States, to great effect, I mean to an effect that we're still feeling right now. So um, I, 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 I say all this because I want to agree with John's premise that ideas matter very much. We, I think, have been sleepwalking since 1989 with the idea that ideas don't matter, right? History's over, there is no alternative. Those are ways of saying there are no ideas. If you say history's over, then, well, you don't have to learn about ideas. If you say there are no alternatives, that means the, the, the thing we have is the only thing that can be, so why think about alternatives? But the idea that there were no ideas was also an idea. It was just a terrible idea and, and, and a politically disabling idea because it means that when ideas started to return, we didn't notice them or we, dis, or we dismissed them. So what, what John kindly mentions, the, the front end of my book, Road to Unfreedom, where I talk about Ivan Ilin and, and some trends in Russian philosophy that have become popular again, what I was trying to show is that 
there are ideas and we can't wish them away. They're there and, and they matter and we, we, have to, we have to react to them. There are, there are alternatives. The alternatives are real. And, and just by saying there are no alternatives, we don't win. In fact, in fact we tend to lose. Okay. Uh, follow, following up on that, what do you see as the challenge that current Kremlin policies are are placing. I mean, obviously, uh, we, we know what they are in Ukraine, although I'd, I'd happy to have your comments there, but more broadly, because you're, you're, the point of your book, The Road to Unfreedom, is how the problems that Mr. Putin has brought to Ukraine, he's also brought to Europe, and he's also brought to America. I think the, mo the, the, the most interesting thing about the politics of the world today is that no one is really able to talk about the future, really, at all. So we're here at Davos, which is the place maybe where people strain the hardest to think about the future. But again, like each year, we, we seem not to be following some kind of a trend. Each year we're alarmed by different things. That's not the same thing as seeing the future. If you look at the history of politics in the West from, you know, from 1789 to 1989, in every generation there were people, whether they were on the right or on the left or on the center, who could project what the future was gonna be like a generation ahead and made plans for it. The most interesting thing about politics in the year 2019 is that the future is gone. The future is gone. No one is talking about, no one has a clear view of the future. And by clear view of the future, I don't mean the robots are gonna take over, right? That's not a clear view of the future. I don't mean all the cities are gonna be underwater. Right? That's not a clear view of the future, what I, although it's true. What I mean is the ability in the ability in politics to guide citizens to something better than the president present by way of a, by way of plausible steps right that is gone and so that's the thing where russia has succeeded right in russian domestic politics there isn't a future and there can't be a future for various reasons nobody knows who's going to rule the country next and you're not allowed to talk about that um, the, the economy is based on hydrocarbons, which makes it hard to talk about the future because of global warming. Um, social mobility in Russia is largely blocked, which means that people have trouble thinking about their own future. So Russia is a kind of capital of futurelessness, um, which sounds better in German. <laughs> Zukunftlosigkeit, right? I don't know if that's a German word, but it could be. Um, the, um, the, so that's their victory, right? So this thing that we call populism Populism has the, has, the abil has the ability to do politics without talking about the future. Making America great again, right, is, is, the, is a way of not talking about the future. Brexit is a way of not talking about the future. Populism in France, Germany, these, these invoke mythical pasts. And as soon as politics is about the mythical past and about emotions in the present, then we're in a completely different place. And that's what's happened. I think the second fundamental way in which Russia has been winning has to do with trust and distrust, right? If you wanna have a future, you have to have facts. If we all have our different sets of facts, we can't have a common future because we can't have a conversation about policy and we can't build things. So if we don't believe there's truth, if we don't believe that there are trustworthy authorities, if we don't believe that there's science, then our democracies or our rule of law systems tend to fall apart. And that's the other way that they've been winning, I think, is this idea not that there's a different truth, but really that there's just no truth at all. That we, there's no reason to trust anything. There's no reason to trust courts or the press or anything. We should just fall back and believe what we want to believe. You, you mentioned the word trust, and you, you, you no, no doubt recall that Frank Fukuyama wrote a book on trust as the basis for a, a, a modern liberal society. Uh, how, do we, how do we get around the problem you've just described? Uh, we, we, we talk about disinformation as a, as a discrete political and social problem. You've just, you've just raised us up a level from disinformation to a uh, concept of, of future or the lack thereof to explain the problem. So how do we get a, gra a grip on this? Well, I mean, for, for, it goes back to your very good question about ideas. I think those of us who care about politics or about journalism or about scholarship have to take an ethical stand on the side of truth. Right? That sounds old fashioned, but I mean, it's so easy to say like, oh, well, what is, you know, what is truth, right? Like that's the easiest move to make, but truth is like health. You can't say exactly what it is, 
and you can't say when you reached it perfectly, right? Who is perfectly healthy? Nobody's, but there's still a profession that cares about health, physicians, right? They're not always right, but they're, they're aiming towards something, nurses. The truth is like that. You can't ever get there, but if you deny it's a thing, you're gonna be in a much worse position. Just like if you say, oh, well, health, health is not real. What is health, right? It's, it's fine to have multiple heart attacks. There's no difference between having multiple heart attacks and not. No, of course there's a difference. Just as there's a difference between reading things that are empirically false over and over again and reading things that are the product of investigative journalism over and over again. So part of it is ethical. I mean, I think one of the big, the, part of the problem after 89 was that we punted on the question of ethics. Um, we said, because if you say there's no alternative, you don't have to make an argument for anything, right? Because it's just, everything's gonna go your way. So now that we recognize there are alternatives, we have to say, well, our system, which depends upon the rule of law um, and individualism, requires factuality. Therefore, factuality is a norm. And then the question is, how do you get there? And you have to have policy. Like, if you think facts are a public good, then you have to have policy that supports them. And that might mean governments supporting local journalism. Norway does that. Norway's a pretty good country. Maybe it's not a crazy idea. Um, it, it, the, it, because here's the thing. Facts don't appear by themselves, right? Facts require hard work. I mean, like health does. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna drop this analogy in a minute, but like, it's hard to go jogging. Who likes to go jogging, right? It's hard, it's hard to do investigative reporting. But the investigative reporters are the people who actually bring the facts across. There are only a few thousand of them in the whole world. You know, as soon as they do something, it then gets plagiarized on the internet 100,000 times, right? And other people take the credit for it. But we basically have a few thousand people who are dragging the rest of us along um, insofar as we have factual knowledge at all. That should be better. There has to be a lot more local news. I mean, one of the things that we know from Russia, actually, um, is that when you lose local news, people then lose trust, and then, and then it's a downhill spiral from there. The US is, mo is closer to that than most European countries are, but the trend is against local news. When you lose local news, then you lose news, people start talking about the media, and the next thing you know, everybody believes in crazy conspiracies. So I think in, in, in addition to just pointing out various kinds of propaganda and how they work, you have to go on the offense by actually trying to fill the space with facts. And when I say fill the space with facts, I mean fill 1% of the space with facts. If you can fill 1% of the space with facts as opposed to like 0.001%, I think democracy is gonna do okay. All right, do you believe that we have turned a corner in the direction you just outlined, or are we still flailing at, at Kremlin disinformation? Not just Kremlin disinformation, it's broader than that. It's, it's much broader than that because it's fun, I mean, because there are issues underneath distrust which go beyond Russia. And, the, and, and indeed, the intelligence of Russian policy is to recognize certain basic trends in the world that m many of us in the West chose not to see and to capitalize, them, capitalize on them. So for example, um, inequality. Why is inequality bad? It's bad for a lot of reasons, but one of them has to do with knowledge. If, um, if, the tw if there were 26 people <clears throat> in the world who have as much wealth as the bottom half population of the world, which by the way is not a hypothesis, if that's true, are those 26 people really living in the same factual world as the bottom half of the population? No. I mean, if, if John has a billion dollars, which, you know, bless him, he, I'm sure he'd do a lot with it, that would be great. But if John has a billion dollars and I have a hundred dollars, we're not living in the same world, right? It's very, and, and if John has a billion dollars and I have a hundred dollars, it's very hard for me to talk to him in a normal way, right? So, part, so one of the like infrastructural preconditions of a factual world is that there's enough equality in the system that people can talk to each other and respect each other. The trend in the world is towards inequality and that makes facts harder. Russia got there first, right? Russia's the most unequal country in the world probably, and so they figured out how to do it. Another trend is technology. <clears throat> So new communications technologies are very messy. We like the printing press, right? We like books. Everybody nod now because it makes me feel better as a historian, thank you. We, 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 we like books, but for 150 years, the book mainly brought about religious war and cataclysmic mass killing, right? The printing press took a long time to get under control. There's that, in European history, there's that inconvenient moment between Reformation and let's say enlightenment where people basically used books to kill each other on a huge scale, 
um, in religious wars. This radio, like radio is very nice. We get our news from BBC at five o'clock in the morning before we go jogging, all of us, I know. Um, <laughs> But radio was also used by the fascists very effectively, right? So new communications technologies have unpredictable effects. When the internet came along, we all said, oh, well, and some of us still say, I'm looking at you, Mark Zuckerberg, where are you? Um, some of us still say, the more contact, the more connectivity we have, the better it will be, the more we will learn. But that's just not true, right? The machines overwhelm the brains and the machines are very good with human help at aiming for the parts of our brains that aren't about thought, that are about emotion, that are about us and them, friend and enemy, what I'm afraid of, right? And that doesn't mean that the internet has to lead to authoritarianism. I mean, so far it has, <laughs> so far it has in general, but it doesn't mean that it has to any more than the printing press has to lead to religious war or radio has to lead to fascism. It does mean that we have to be sensible about how we approach every new communications technology because the way the internet works now does tend to favor people who talk about, who talk about the past, um, who, who look for friend-enemy distinctions. Um, so we need to work on that. Okay, I'm glad you turned my question into a discussion of trends. Uh, but what strikes me is the trends you refer to are, um, you might say, below or encompassing the political level. Because the trend that, that most commentators are focusing on these days is populism, or better, better yet, authoritarian populism. Do you see that, you see that presumably as an offshoot of inequality and their ability to harness new technology. But as an historian who's used to thinking in, in terms of, of, of long, t long periods of time, what, what sort of half-life do you see for authoritarian populism, looking forward? Uh, I think it's a, it's a short half-life because authoritarian populism is a stepping stone towards something much worse. Um, the interesting thing about the kind of populism we have is that it doesn't have a clear idea of its own future, which means that once I its job is to clear away certain things, like the European Union or representative democracy, but once those things get cleared away, the thing that comes next is gonna be surprising and it's gonna be worse and no one knows what it is, but it's not gonna be good. Um, I mean, the classic example is the 1930s and you'll just, I mean, I, every time I talk about Nazi Germany, I, like I, it takes a year off the end of my life, so here I go. But the, in, in Nazi Germany, the, the people who brought about the regime change in 1932, 1933 did not know that Hitler was coming. On the contrary, they thought Hitler wasn't coming. They just wanted to get rid of democracy, right, for their own reasons. And then surprising things happen after you get rid of the rules of, of the game. So I think, I think, I mean, this isn't what you mean by the question, but I think it has, an, it has a short life because it's a stepping, st either it gets defeated or it's a stepping stone towards something which is, which is worse, right? So in the case of Russia, I mean, Putin-style politics has a short half-life because it's a stepping stone towards just doing what China wants, basically. Um, so, the, um, the, the, but the, so the second thing that I want to say in respect to this is that democracy is really hard. So if you look at history, as you asked me to do, democratic systems have generally failed. They've generally collapsed. I mean, the whole, the whole story of Greek democracy is really a story of people criticizing democracy after it falls apart. And by the way, a lot of the things that the Greeks said, like about inequality, for example, I mean, what the, the Greek critique of democracy, or one of them was, if you let inequality get too high, then demagogues will come along and they will persuade people to vote against democracy. You know, okay, they were right about that. Um, so, so part of it, so, so democracy is hard, right? I mean, it's not the default. The, no alternatives, when we say history is over, there are no alternatives, we are saying democracy is the default, but it's not. Democracy is the result of ethical and, uh, and practical commitments. It's a result of, of, of work. But part of, it is, I, I, part of it is, I agree, I think, or I, is, is social advance. So democracy, is a, democracy requires time and it produces time. When democracy says, I can change my mind. Democracy says I can think in two or four or six year bursts into the future. When people think the future is gonna be worse than the past or if they can't think about the future at all, democracy becomes harder. And as social advances become harder in the US, for example, a democracy has become less popular. But another, another problem is, another issue is globalization. Globalization does affect people unequally. And by the way, it's perfectly normal 
to make a conservative point, it's perfectly normal for people to take a while to adjust to new things. It's unreasonable to expect people to adjust immediately to everything all, all, all at once. And part of the, the task of the state is to modulate, to get in there and make sure no, things don't have to happen too fast, so. Okay. Um, you said something really interesting. You said many things really interesting, but I'll focus on one. Um, you said this current phase that we see of populism has a short half-life. But, and this is, this is very important, um, essentially, you said it's not clear what follows that half-life. On the one hand, it could, be, it could be chaos, which we can't quite see yet. My question, is it also possible that there could be a, an optimist scenario here? This period of populism will be followed by a period of reinvigorated democracy. Oh, I think that's, I think that's absolutely, I mean, I've got, I've got lots of negative scenarios. Like I have, I have more ideas of what can happen <laughs> after populism plays itself out, which it will, but you didn't ask me that. So I'm gonna try to answer your question. Yes, I absolutely do think that. And I think, and I think in some sense, it's good that this challenge ha is happening now rather than five years from now, um, because now, we still have a certain amount of memory of what the alternatives were like in the West, some of memory. In five or 10 years, it'll be pretty much gone. Um, n n now, um, we, we, now, you know, young people are, young people are, I mean, this is a sad trend, right? But young people are moving away from belief in democracy. If that had gone on for five or 10 more years before this discussion started, we could be in a very, bad place. But I absolutely do think this. I think, I think democracies actually need these challenges um, to, to, to begin ethical discussions about what kind of system they want to have, and also discussions about what the state has, has to do. Democracy is not a laissez-faire situation on its own. But, I mean, if we look at the Russian intervention in Ukraine, for example, the Russian intervention in Ukraine was a test. The price for it is being paid almost entirely by Ukrainians but it began a moment of testing the European Union as well as North American democracies. And some, some institutions and some individuals have passed, but the important thing is that we see it as a test because it, it's, it, it, we, we need these challenges, but then like this is the terrifying thing. It's up to us to see them as challenges and not just to say, because the danger is if you think every, there are no alternatives, a challenge comes along, you don't see it as a challenge. You think, oh, well, somehow automatically history's on our side, the institutions will save us, whatever. Or, you know, the, you know, the idea like economics is the only thing that matters, which American Democrats and American Republicans tend to think. If you think economics is the only thing that matters, then you say, well, we're the biggest economy, then you think everything's gonna work out. But it, but it doesn't, right? The terrifying thing is that, or the invigorating thing, is that it's a matter of choice. Do you see this as a challenge, right? In the 30s, John Maynard Keynes saw fascism and communism as a challenge and thought about what the state could do to keep liberal orders going. In the 1940s, American presidents saw totalitarianism as a challenge, and that actually led to a reformulation of American democracy. American democracy in the 50s and 60s and 70s was more progressive and expansive in various ways, in part because there was a challenge. But, you know, do we see it as a challenge? Can we react to it as a challenge? That for me is the question. All right, well, well let's explore that question a little bit more if I, if I, with your forbearance. Uh, certainly there's a better understanding today, or challenge me if you disagree, than there was three or four years ago about the populist uh, question. Uh, again, do you think the tide is turning or do you think this is still a, a battle very much in doubt? I'm gonna just, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be very persnickety here, and I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna disagree with the tide metaphor. Okay, please. Because if the tide, like, because we have this really strong tendency to think only about the last few months and the next election. So, like, if Macron wins, remember this. If Macron wins, everything is fine. You remember that moment? Okay. Um, but maybe it's good for Macron to win, but it doesn't mean everything is fine, right? Or if the Polish elections go a certain way, everything will be okay. We get obsessed about the next elections, which is a substitute for thinking about, you know, the, 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 deeper, the deeper problems. So there, are cer there have certainly been some good signs recently in important Western countries, sure. Um, but what I worry about is the 
midterm challenge of rebuilding societies and institutions in such a way that we don't have to worry about each election. The fact that we still worry about each election is a, is a sign that we're not out of the woods yet. Okay, you, you answered the question, that's good, that's good. All right, if we could just flip a little bit. You said something in passing, which I liked because it reflects my, my own thinking. Uh, you said you think Russia is on a path towards being essentially the, the servant of China. Could you uh, elucidate that a little bit? Okay, well, I mean, this goes back to your first question about how you think about history. Uh, the, um, Rush, part of, I mean, part of the thing that characterizes Ru the way Russia sees itself, and you know, Russians here can correct me if you want in questions, is that Russia identifies statehood with being, with being a world power. And this is a vulnerability, right? Like everything you care about is a vulnerability. Um, so if you care about being a world power, like how do you show your world power? In your, if you're Russia in 2014 or 2016. You can show your world power by messing with the European Union. The European Union is the biggest economy in the history of the world. The European economy is a positive alternative for many Russians. It looks good from Russia. And you can mess around with the United States. You know, everybody in Russia recognizes the United States as a superpower. Like they think that Americans are as obsessed with being a superpower as Russians are, which by the way, they're not, right? It's not, a, in America, like being a superpower is not a thing the way it is in Russia. Um, no, it's mainly because Americans don't realize there's anything else in the world. So if you don't realize there's anything else in the world, the whole notion of being a superpower isn't coherent, right? Because like superpower over what? They're just, I mean, so, but, but my point is every, like everything you want is a vulnerability. Russia wants to be seen as a superpower. How are you a superpower? You mess with the American elections, right? But from the point of view of China, that's China playing Russia's vulnerability. Because what it means is that Russia goes out front and it does things which the Chinese are too tactful or too sensible to do or to be caught doing, right? So in other words, Russia's desire to be a superpower makes it vulnerable to a kind of geopolitics of instant gratification. Invading Ukraine and taking Crimea is the politics of instant gratification, right? Like that moment, you remember that moment in the Duma where you know Putin announces and signs and there's a red carpet and people are crying very meaningful. That's the politics of instant gratification. It's fun to take a little bit of territory from your, 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 your helpless neighbor while it's in a moment of crisis. It's great fun, right? But, it, but violating the principle of territorial sovereignty when you have an incredibly long border with China is not geopolitics, right? It's geopolitic, geopolitically incredibly unwise to announce that you know, when you actually have a geopolitical problem, which is, the, which, is the, which is a country which is more powerful than you on, your, the, uh, in, in, on, the, on the east, to violate the principle of territorial sovereignty or to say that it doesn't really matter is not particularly a smart move. So, I mean, this, what I think has happened is that Russia has fallen into a geopolitical trap where they have, I mean, they have, they, they have pursued intelligently and consistently and to great effect a policy of trying to make the European Union weaker and to make the United States more chaotic, and you know, I, I feel the success of that with every with every breath. And at a tactical level, you know, congratulations. But at a strategic level, Russia's strategic position historically in the real history of the world, and not the history where the only thing that matters is who baptized whom in Kiev. And by the way, it never happened. You know, the in, in the real world of geopolitics, the thing that matters is um, is Russia's ability to balance itself between the West and China. And what it has done is that it's tipped itself way too far in one direction, which is why I think the, the afterlife of Putinism is, you know. Very sure. Yeah. Okay, I've been a rude moderator and monopolized your time. So let's take a few questions from the audience. Okay, right there. And then over here. Please identify yourself. Sasha Volkov, member of Ukrainian diaspora here in Switzerland. Uh, <laughs> Professor Snyder, I have a practical question. Uh, we are, uh, for five years already, we are here in diaspora, uh, talk to policymakers, to um, ordinary people, trying to explain to them what happens in Ukraine and to why should they care. Uh, perhaps can you help me just with two simple things, two simple theses where you would say, okay, if you want to attract attention of people broadly in the West to Ukraine, what should 
what what would be uh, what should I talk about? What uh, what should I focus about? Uh, you, you're here in Switzerland, or where 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 do you live? Central Switzerland. In Swiss, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, getting the attention of the Swiss may be a challenge, which is above anyone. Yeah, yeah. I mean. The, the, the way that I try to go at it is by explaining that y Ukraine's problems are Europe's problems, and if you can solve them in Ukraine, that's going to help them. That's going to help solve them in Europe. So, the, the, the way the re Ukrainians know more about things like digital warfare and oligarchy than Europeans do, but those are dangers in Europe itself. Right. So there's that. There's like the early warning system argument. If you pay attention to our country, you can understand things in time. Right. This, by the way, was what I was trying to say in America in 2016 with zero effect. So, but but it, it is it is at least an argument. Right. That we that it's an early warning system. Um, another. I mean, an, another argument is the another way is you, you you pick on the things that people care about. Right. So people care about inequality. Some people care about inequality. Some people care about the rule of law. Right. Ukraine is a place where the politics of these kinds of things is very is very vivid. But I mean, in larger terms, for the European project generally, um, if Europe works, it's going to be attractive. So the sign that Ukraine is that Ukraine wants to get closer to Europe is a sign that Europe works. Right. And that's and that's inevitable. One has to take that for granted. Um, but, you know, it's 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 tough. I know it's tough. I know it's tough. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, deep insights. Uh, my name is Johannes Tröger. I'm actually by training a historian, but I've been working now for the last five years for a German-Ukrainian company. So we have our headquarters in Heidelberg, and we've, uh, we have our about 40 developers sitting in Kiev. Actually, originally they were on Crimea, so we had to move them out, which was difficult for a small company with without let's say, a lot of corporate overhead. Please get to the question. Yeah, so um, <laughs> we are constantly analyzing the situation, no, obviously. Question. And the question is, um, you said it's a test, um, what they did in eastern Ukraine. Do you see that there is any more testing ahead very soon, moving further to the west of, of Ukraine? Well, I mean, if you're talking about Ukraine, I think the, the interesting thing about 2013, 2014, into 2015, because um, there, there are three distinct moments of Russian military intervention. There's there's Crimea, then there's the summer of 14, then there's the winter of 1415. What's interesting about that campaign is that the Russians understood very quickly that the digital part was working better than the conventional part. In other words, the, the army of the Russian Federation, which is one of the best armies in the world, had trouble handling a foe which basically did not have organized armed forces. Um, that that is a striking lesson, right? And it makes Russia, in a way, more like other advanced countries, where there's a there's a real hesitation to actually commit troops because they might be killed, and what you're what you're basically running is a narrative rather than rather than a war. But the narrative part worked extremely well. I mean, the 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 information offensive, according to which you know Ukraine was either a Jewish conspiracy or it was a fascist conspiracy or what, I mean, depending on the audience, right? The, the information warfare worked extremely well at the level, at least at the level of disabling um, a European or an American consensus. It worked for six or nine months very well. That's the lesson, right? I mean, the, the way that Ukraine messes, the way that Russia messes around with the, in Ukraine is primarily informational, primarily technological, and the same is true for us. So, and it's working well enough that I don't expect that to change. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, let's hang on you off and then Mr. Uh, thank you for a great panel, Ilya Panamarev. Um, my question uh, uh, relates to what you have started from, to a uh, question of uh, uh, roots of Ukrainian nationalism and uh, the nation building of uh, uh, present day Ukraine. Uh, what I see all the time in Ukraine, that uh, uh, Ukrainian nationalism today is something which is reactive rather than proactive. Like, we are not Russia, and Russians get lost. But then, who is uh, uh, Ukrainians? Uh, what is the vision? Why do you think, uh, and what are the roots uh, of, 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 of this problem, that Kyiv right now is not presenting an alternative model of leadership which actually can be very peacifying uh, uh, for the region. So 
I, I think you're exactly right. I mean, in, in defense of Ukraine, it's not that easy to come up with a positive model of the nation when you know when you have Russia on the one side and then your your Polish friends kind of drop you you know at, on the other side because the, y Ukrainian it's hard to have a conversation about the Ukrainian nation without some reference to Russia and Poland and they haven't they haven't been different ways they haven't been helping in the last few years but I think you have your finger on something which is exactly right and which, by the way, the nation builders of the 19th century understood perfectly well. They didn't care about poetry and literature and so on for their own sake. They cared about them as the basis for building a, a community which could then move into the future. It was all about the future. And for Ukraine in 2019, it is still, it's still all about the future. And so national leadership, leadership of the nation is much more about saying what's Ukraine like in 2040 than it is defending yourself in 1943, right? That's, it's much more important. And, in, and indeed, like, the escape back to the past to say, like, we were always innocent and people are accusing us of bad things, that, that, that move to irresponsibility can be very disabling when you think about the future, right? Because if you say about, if what you say about the past is it wasn't our fault, if that's all you have to say about the past, it's very hard to say something about the future, right? Because you've already put yourself in this position of being a victim or being overwhelmed by, by other people. So the key thing in what you say is that the national project is always an institution building project with an eye to the future, or else it's not really a national project. Okay, we have time for just two questions. First, Dan, then over there. Yes. Well, two take the two together. Yeah, uh, Daniel Bilek. Uh, thanks, Tim. That uh, fantastic as always. Uh, picking up on the last question and the first question, you know, frankly, nobody cares. And this is my experience with investors: is that you can explain why Ukraine, why you need Ukraine, that we are on the doorstep, we are fighting Russia's war, your your war against Russia. We're in the middle. It's all negative. Um, what 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 I come up against in dealing with with his investors is something that Simon Anholt, uh, I think, really. Uh, developed today, and that is points of relevance. How is Ukraine and what is happening in Ukraine relevant to the lives of the average European? And if we need to be able to connect at that level, and if that's the case, what do you think that we should be telling them? Oh, and ask the question, another yes. question. Okay, so I'm Catherine Belinga uh, from Canada. Thank you so much for again showing us how important historians are to society. Thank you, Professor. Um, so my question is related to Dan's, which is what do you think Ukraine's contribution is to the world? What is it? In ter and and, and um, why should somebody in New York, Tajikistan, Melbourne, Sydney, Tokyo care. So I think, I mean, I, I, the, to turn the question back around a little bit, it, it, there are other countries and other times and places that have gone through hard times and then have had foreign investment. And the reason they succeeded was not that they managed to tell their story in an attractive way. I'm not saying that Ukraine is Germany. I'm just going to point out at all I'm just going to point out that, you know, in West Germany in 1947, there wasn't necessarily a whole lot of international sympathy, right? Well, yeah, the, yeah, okay. I'm for that. <laughs> I'm for the Marshall Plan for Ukraine. But, but the ability, I mean, the fundamental thing is, is, not, is not the ability to tell a story. The fundamental thing is the ability to predict the future. And predicting the future depends on the rule of law, and there's just no way around that. What I think history can do is that it can clear away some of the misconceptions, right? So if you don't want to invest in Ukraine because it never existed, history can help with that, right? If you don't want to invest in Ukraine because you think it's always been some kind of right-wing hellhole, history can definitely help with that, right? If you, if you don't think that Ukrainians are a society, then history can help with that. But it can only go so far. You can't make it get into people's, I mean, people in France don't care that much about the history of Germany either, right? It's a lot to expect. But in terms of people's everyday lives, Ukraine dealt with a refugee crisis better than Europe, way better than Europe, 
right? Um, you, Ukraine, is, Ukraine is facing some of the challenges that Europeans have faced. One has to be modest about it. I mean, what you can't say is like, Russia attacked us and defeated us and it was terrible, right? What you have to be able to say is, this thing that you face with AFD or with Front National, we face too, and here are the helpful lessons that we learned from it, right? Because nobody, wa I mean, you, that Ukrainian history has horrors, I know, like this is the subject of my work, and it's important that everyone know what they are. But in terms of the politics of the everyday, what you have to be able to say is, we learned that in responding to disinformation, A, B, and C worked, and we'd like to be able to share that lesson with you, that kind of thing. Well, thank you very much, Tim. And I know Alexa wants to give us something. Thank you very much to our esteemed guests for that truly fascinating conversation and to Ambassador Herbst for your expert moderating as per usual. Thank you. Professor Snyder, it is my true honor on behalf of the entire Ukraine House Organizing Committee to present you with the Ukraine House Award for your original and profound scholarship, for your dedication to principle and to the truth, and for your perspicacity in identifying and examining important periods of history that are often overlooked. We truly admire your values. Thank you so much for your important work. Please join me in giving Professor Snyder a warm round of applause. Thank you.